Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today's reading, at least part of it, I'm sure sounded very familiar to you, right? Because we all heard it three weeks ago. We, we read Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 in Advent. And, and that, was in, uh, that was about three weeks ago. And we learned in Advent about verses 4 through 8 from this gospel account of Mark. So the part we left out today was the very beginning. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. This was a message of what was to come. And it was from Isaiah. Our theme this Advent was preparation. And each week, as we lit the candles, we addressed one way in particular that we could prepare for the coming of Christ. And the theme for the day when we read this particular text was listen. And so today, let's listen for what the gospel writer Mark wants to tell us, which begins with the baptism of Jesus. So first, it's important to know that Mark is a gospel writer whose main purpose is to lead us to the culminary event of Jesus' time with us, which is his death and resurrection. Mark is a very quick gospel that gets right to the point and tells us in short form all the things that Mark thinks are important that we know leading us to the cross. So it's no surprise that Mark jumps straight into the adult life of Jesus, beginning with a brief introduction to John the Baptist, the person who was to proclaim and prepare the way for Christ, to the baptism of Christ by verse 9 in the first chapter of this gospel. In some of our gospels, it takes a couple chapters to get there. Right away in Mark, we hear God proclaim, You are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Speaking as a voice coming from heaven, immediately after the Spirit descends on him like a dove. It's important to note that John declares that he baptizes with water, but the one coming after him, which we know is Jesus, will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And while Mark's movement in the gospel is very fast, he always writes connected like this. We're going to hear over the next year as we listen to the stories from Mark, the words immediately or as soon as, or again he, or then he, from Mark as he moves this gospel forward to the final point. But even though it's always an abrupt transfer, the next thing is always connected to the thing before and the next and the very end of the story, that Christ will triumph over sin and death for all of humankind. In fact, this is so central for Mark, this culminating death and resurrection um, in order to save us that the, his gospel ends very abruptly with the women coming out to the tomb and then finding he uh, has risen, and that's it. That's the end. That's the most important thing that we need to know. And so Mark's like, here you go. This is the story. It's kind of like how we hear other stories of like, how Santa came into being, or why Aggies stand for the entirety of the football game, right? <laughs> Except in this case, the story is how we were saved by, from our own sin and death because of what Christ did for us. And so I admit that was way more important than Santa, and probably the Aggies too. <laughs> so finally, now that we know a little bit more about how Mark writes his gospel, the last thing to listen for or to note is how he bookends his gospel, how it begins and how it ends. He begins with John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus into his ministry, and the Spirit coming down, making its presence, and God's voice claiming Christ as my son, the beloved. So what do you hear in that one sentence? That's right, you hear the Trinity, the triune God. So Mark begins his gospel with this, this appearance from the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he ends it, spoiler alert again, with Christ rising. We'll get to that later on after Lent, but that's how Mark ends his gospel. He tells us from the very beginning to the very end that Christ is part of a triune relationship which becomes our salvation. 
And so as we begin this year in our revised lectionary cycle, I invite you to listen to each reading from Mark, at least in part as if you were listening for who God is and what God is up to. How do each of the stories relate to each other, but ultimately to who God is and what God is doing with us and for us? then, back then in the day, but also now. What do these stories tell us about Jesus and why would Mark choose them to lead us to the cross and resurrection? But as this passage was used in Advent to teach us in preparation to listen, now, how might we use it to proclaim? Because in Advent, we were preparing And at Christmas, then we praised because Christ had come. And now that Christ has come, we are to proclaim that good news. So how do we do that? Because after all, Mark starts the gospel, the very first words of Mark's gospel in verse 1 are the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So how do we proclaim that? Because we talked in Advent about how our world is kind of noisy And we contemplated on what it might mean for us to be truly listening for, and thus what we were to proclaim. So here in the Gospel of Mark, Mark pretty well spells it out for us, right? We're listening for the good news. And the first bit of good news we hear in today's reading is that what was prophesied had come into being from that voice crying out in the wilderness. And this voice of John the Baptist was there to proclaim that Christ's coming had happened, and he was preparing the people. He does this by baptizing the people in the wilderness and witnessing to the ministry that is about to come. He even baptizes Jesus in front of all the people and kind of hands over that, that ministry and that power and that witness to Jesus. He prepares them to know that while he isn't the Messiah, the Messiah will come And his baptism will be different, yet connected. John baptizes with water, and so do we. Yet Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And now in our baptism, we know that the Holy Spirit comes to us just because it came through Christ, and we are baptized into Christ. Now, for better or worse, Mark's gospel ends with the resurrection, and I say that because it's very abrupt So my first inclination as I get to the end is, okay, now what? We have this big, huge moment, and then then it stops. Matthew, Luke, and John give us really awesome post-resurrection stories, and they're filled with uh, rich, um, rich examples of how to move forward after the resurrection. But Mark doesn't do that. Mark leaves us wondering, okay, well, what am I supposed to tell? But... I think that's just it, right? This is the point. He has gotten to the point, and this is the important point, and that's what we are to tell. We are to tell about this good news, that everything that Christ did was leading up to this death and then the the defeating of death in his rising. The other thing, though, Mark does all throughout the gospel is he reminds people of the law. In the Old Testament, God gives people the law through Moses, And that's a covenant between God and the people that follow the Lord to help them uphold the greatest of all commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. But we as a fallen people, we often fall short of that, don't we? We're not able to fully embrace that part over and over again. So the triune God has now come with the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is the law is not what saves us. God is what saves us. So we're called to still live the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus doesn't come to get us off the hook, so to speak. Actually, Jesus comes and shows us how to live in the spirit of why the law was given and how to live it that way. He comes to show us that it's still God's covenant with us, but there's more to that covenant. And he also shows us That when we get too legalistic and we depend on the law too much, we forget about that relationship with God. So finally, again, comes the rest of the story. 
while the law is still important and Jesus shows us how to live it, God saves us through Jesus Christ, the beloved Son, our Lord. This is the long-awaited salvation. This is God's grace that God has given to the people. This new covenant that we hear in Jeremiah chapter 31. We are God's people, and God is our God. In our baptism with Christ, the Holy Spirit claims us, just as God claimed Jesus at his own baptism. This is the good news that our life has purpose and meaning, that we are called to live as Christ, and that we're baptized into a new life in Christ. Now, it's believed that Matthew and Luke took little pieces from Mark to write their own gospel stories. They think that Mark wrote his first, and then Matthew and Luke kind of used theirs a little bit of, you know, they didn't have, like, copyright laws back then. So they used a little bit of Mark's gospel, and I'm really glad they did but also, they remember what kind of people we are, a little bit forgetful, a little bit clueless sometimes. So they give us some last-minute stories and instruction. And my favorite of those is from Matthew. Mark's point is to lead us to Christ's death and resurrection. Matthew teaches us that our job is to proclaim that good news with the very final verses of his gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So now we've heard God's word. We have praised God's word. Let us go forward and proclaim the good news. Amen.